So oral epidemiology, this is when we're looking at oral diseases <clears throat> and oral conditions. So for example, um, these epidemiologists would be looking at periodontal disease in a population, periodontal disease in Canada, periodontal disease in India, whatever, wherever it is that they want to um, study, periodontal disease in China. So it can be any population, whatever they're interested in. Uh, so periodontal disease is an example. Oral cancer is another example. Um, herpetic lesions, how many herpes someone's get, someone gets orally. There's, there's so many, um, even like things like candidiasis, leukoplakia, all those mucosal infections and conditions, they're all things that epidemiologists study. Now, before we're talking about multifactorial and how disease, any sickness or any disease has many, multi, many, many factors that play a role. So let's look at the multifactorial um, nature of periodontal disease, or actually of periodontitis, so bone loss. You can see that there's many factors in play. There's the environment. So what is the environment like of the uh, person? Does this person have good oral health self-care or bad oral health self-care? Lots of plaque or little plaque? Lots of sub-G calc or no sub-G calculus? We look at the person itself, the host. What age is he or, or she? What gender? Do they have diabetes? Are they smoking? Because we know that that plays a huge role in periodontitis. Are they under stress? Again, all these are uh, links to getting periodontitis. And then the agent, and the agent that we talked about in the previous video are the actual, the what, the actual item that's causing the periodontal disease. So you need biofilm, you need plaque, you need bacteria to cause periodontitis. So these are all different. Actually, what you can see from here is just, if not just bacteria alone, it's just, it's not plaque alone that causes periodontitis. It's a multi-factor, it is a, there's a lot involved. There's also the environment. There's also the host. One thing that um, is important to note that when we're looking at the host, the person, yes, these are great uh, tips, but there's also other ones such as the tooth morphology. So if their teeth are crowded, they're more likely to get periodontitis. If they have low salivary flow, they're more likely to get caries. So lots of factors in play, not just biofilm, not just bacteria. So where can you go? Where can you go to find these reports? Where can you go to find uh, what people, what epidemiologists have published about how much disease there is somewhere, how much injury, um, actually dental injury, how much dental injury there is somewhere, how much disability and all those factors. Where can you go? Well, here's one. Actually, every country has a different place where you can go, but there's a national or a global one that's called NOHSS, National Oral Health Surveillance System. And if you uh, search them up, you'll see that they study eight different things. They look at how many people go for dental visits, cleanings, um, how many people have lost all their teeth, six teeth, six or more teeth, um, if they have fluoride or no fluoride in their country, uh, sealants, caries, how many are untreated caries, and then oral cancer. So they look at eight different indicators. And there have, there's um, basically a five action recommendation in the National Call to Action to promote oral health. So basically they came up with five tips. And I'm not gonna go through all those tips, but what you can see is they wanna make oral health a priority. And so they wanna change the perception of oral health. So that's one of the goal, the national goal that they have, or the, the recommendations actually, one thing they, they recommend. They wanna overcome barriers. So if you know cost is an issue, are there ways to have free programs for these um, individuals that cost is an issue? They want um, to build the science base of oral health. So they want to have more research um, so that when you have more new oral health research, it will translate to the dental setting. So there's lots of things that they're, they're recommending for the whole nation to change. And then there's Global, Global Oral Health Data Bank. And this is by done by or managed by the WHO which is the World Health Organization. And again, when you research them, you're gonna find information or data numbers on dental caries, periodontal disease, tobacco, oral cancer, and all different types of oral conditions. So we have the Global Oral Health Data Bank and we have the NOHSS. So those are two 
um, national ones. Oh, this one is national and then this one is global. So worldwide, countrywide, um, places where you can go to find data on your country. Okay, so this is, um, these are some terms or these two risk and causality are terms that epidemiologists use. And the important thing to get actually from this is that risk, if there is um, a risk factor, that means that it causes something. So if you have a risk factor of tobacco use, so if you use tobacco, that will cause periodontal disease. If you have diabetes that are un that's uncontrolled, that will cause periodontal disease. So risk factors suggest cause or suggest causality. So there's different types of risk. There's risk factors, there's risk indicators, and then there's risk predictors, also known as risk markers. So let's look at these. Now, before I actually go into more detail about the difference between you know, these three, I want to look at this table and I want to go over the studies. So you'll see here it says longitudinal studies, and then you'll see something called cross-sectional studies. So for this video, I'm just going to compare those two, longitudinal versus cross-sectional. So a longitudinal study is when you study a person or many different people and you study them for a long period of time. So you study them for years and years and years. So I could be looking at like a thousand girls and then I follow them over time as they become a woman and then as they become even older and I you know, follow them that way and I take data about their plaque, about their biofilm, about the status of periodontal disease as they're progressing. Longitudinal disease or sorry, longitudinal studies are studies that are done for a very long period of time and you follow that same person for a very long period of time. It's not just one person, it's a lot of people. It's a big sample size, a lot of people. But cross-sectional is when we're looking at cross-sectional um, study. Cross-sectional study is you study um, people at one point of time. So for example, if I have a timeline, okay, so there's a timeline, um, let's say we're in 2021 to uh, 2022, and I'm going to have two different timelines. So there's another timeline that's 2021 um, to, let's say, 2041. Okay, so if I do a cross-sectional study, and um, let's say it is in the month of August, I find some people to do my study. And so in August, I do a study. I bring, like, let's say I bring, I don't know, um, 1,000 people to come to my study in August, and I assess their uh, dentition, and I assess for periodontal disease. Okay, so I assess for periodontal disease in August. One point in time. Do I follow up with them? No. Do I see them in 2023 again? No. If I only see them once, so in that whole period, I only see them once, that is a cross-sectional study. A longitudinal study is when you see them for like a long period of time. So in this case, I see them for 20 years. So for 20 years, I will follow, um, I, again, same a thousand people. I will follow a thousand people. So what do you think is, uh, which study do you think is stronger, cross-sectional study or longitudinal study? I'm hoping you said longitudinal study because yes, there's the same amount of people but here I see them again and again and again, possibly every year for 20 years. So my data that I'm collecting is rich, is credible. Whereas here, I'm just seeing them at only once, August, and that's it. I'm not going to see them again and again and again, like this one. So cross-sectional study is weaker. Longitudinal study is way better. Okay, so let's put this all in together. Um, risk factors is modifiable. What that means is that it can be changed. So for example, tobacco use, you can quit tobacco and then that's no longer a risk factor. You can control your diabetes if it's type two and then that's no longer a risk factor. So it could be modifiable, it could be changed. And so if they find that, if they conclude that tobacco use is a risk factor, what they're saying here is that tobacco causes periodontal disease. So a risk factor is something that cause, that infers causality that cause periodontal disease. So all these things could cause periodontal disease. How did they come up with these risk factors? Well, they did longitudinal studies. They studied people over and over and over again for so many years. And 
because they did a longitudinal study, they can now determine that these risk factors cause periodontal disease. Let's look at a different one. Risk indicators. So we can see here there's a bunch of risk indicators. For example, um, let's see, let's look at one thing. We, um, low socioeconomic status. So if someone's poor, if someone is poor, does that cause periodontal disease? Well, no. Risk indicator, if you look over here, cannot, cannot be used to infer causality. That means if you have any of these risk indicators, it doesn't mean that you will get periodontal disease. Whereas here, tobacco use and diabetes, yes, there's a very high chance that it will cause periodontal disease. But risk indicators do not mean that it causes periodontal disease. These, these are just risk. Yes, you could get periodontal disease. You could not get periodontal disease with some of these. But it doesn't mean that if you have it, you will get periodontal disease. These are just additional risk. And then there's something called risk predictors or risk markers, which again were, cross, were found through cross-sectional studies, which means at one point in time, that's how they got these information. Um, so bleeding on probing, that's a risk predictor. And what this means is that if you have BOP, if you have bleeding on probing, bleeding on probing does not cause periodontal disease. What it means is if you have BOP, there could be the reason why you have BOP could be because of poor oral hygiene level, which again could be because maybe you have diabetes. So when you have these things that you're looking at, that's not the cause of periodontal disease. Those are just additional information. Whenever you have a risk predictor or a risk marker, what it says over here is that it indicates greater need to control modifiable risk factors. So if you have these things, that just means we got to control this. We got to control tobacco use. We got to control your diabetes level. We got to control how much bacteria you have in your mouth because that all uh, plays a role in periodontitis. But these are just predictions. They predict that if you have BOP, you may get P, uh, periodontitis. If you have Cal, you may get periodontitis. But you know, some people with BOP do not get periodontitis. So again, just to recap, risk factors, these things are modifiable. It can be changed. They are found through longitudinal studies, through studies that have been conducted over a long period of time. And these things, because they have done longitudinal studies, this we can say it infers causality. If you have any of these, you will. It does cause periodontitis. Risk indicators, these Things if you have, we can't say that this causes periodontitis, but we can say that those are risk factors or risk indicators rather for periodontitis. So if you have osteoporosis, you could get periodontitis, you could not get periodontitis. Um, it's a risk indicator, but not everyone with osteoporosis will get periodontitis. And then risk predictors, that's even less um, important. So risk factors are more important, risk predictors are less important. Yes, these are important points, BOP, Cal, and all that. But if you have BOP, it does not cause periodontitis. All this means is we need to control the risk factors even better. So I hope that kind of explains the difference between these three terms. So in dental hygiene and dentistry, there's lots of examples of causality. If you have bacteria, if you have plaque, it causes gingivitis. And how do we know this? Because we did lots of longitudinal studies to see this. So there are many people who have plaque that cause, um, when you have plaque, it does cause gingivitis. If you have a lot of sugar, that does, that can cause dental caries. If you seek fluoride treatment, that can help with preventing dental caries. If you floss, that can help with resolving your gingivitis. So there are causalities that epidemiologists and researchers have studied to, um, so we're going back to here. To, so there are factors, risk factors, that can cause periodontal disease or periodontitis. Now, when we're looking at causality, when we're looking at what causes periodontal disease or what, um, yeah, what causes periodontal disease, and we can look at this example, can smoking cause periodontal disease? Well, there are some criteria we look for. So there's something called strength of association. And this means that the stronger the association between the exposure and the outcomes. Okay, let's, let's look at what exposure means and let's look at what outcome means. 
Exposure is tobacco, you smoking, and outcome is periodontal disease. That's what's going to happen. So if we see strong links between tobacco and periodontal disease, then for sure it's, it can cause each other. So can smoking cause periodontal disease? Well, if you see lots, if you read lots of studies and you notice that there's smoking and periodontal disease always go together and, and cause, um, smoking causes periodontal disease, then you can say that there is a strength of association. There is a link, a strong link between them. And it has to be consistent. So if you see lots of studies showing that smoking causes periodontal disease, replication studies, or many studies being done again and again on the same topic, and if you see the same conclusion, then you can say, yeah, it could cause it. Smoking can cause periodontal disease because there are many studies, a large number of studies showing the same thing, the same association. Sensitivity of association. If those who have the disease were exposed to the suspected causative factor, the factor is more likely to be causal. So if you have um, periodontal disease and you're smoking, again, because you were exposed to tobacco and you, you got periodontal disease, again, you can make that association. So there's many things um, that can cause periodontitis, such as smoking. And as long as you can see that there is a strength there, it's happening consistently, and you always see that people who were smoking gets periodontal disease, you can definitely conclude and say, yes, smoking can cause periodontitis. If you notice that an absence of exposure is associated with absence of disease, then again, you can make the conclusion of, the, of that smoking can cause periodontal disease. So for example, if you see people not smoking and they don't get periodontal disease, then you know there's a link. If you don't smoke and you don't get periodontal disease, then you then you can assume that if you do smoke and you get periodontal disease, there is an association, right? So um, if you see this happening also with people who have, so if you see, I should be with that. If you see people who don't smoke, if they don't smoke and they don't get periodontal disease, then you can also assume that people who do smoke will get periodontal disease. So it's kind of like a reverse Time relationship. So if you see that the exposure precedes the outcome, so the exposure, the smoking comes before periodontal disease. So this person has been smoking for so long, didn't have periodontal disease, then got periodontal disease, causality is more likely. So usually the, ex the exposure, the smoking happens, and then you get periodontal disease. And then dose response relationship. And this is so true. If the um, degree of exposure increases, so if you smoke more and more, so if you're smoking like a pack a day or two packs a day or three packs a day, and then you notice that this person is getting periodontal disease and their degree of periodontal disease is also worse, that's a dose-response relationship. So the more you smoke, the worse your periodontal disease condition would be. Plausibility, this is where if the association is congruent with the current biological, medical, and epidemiologic and scientific knowledge, causality is more likely. So if you say that, you know, smoking causes periodontal disease, and that's what, like, the scientific knowledge is saying, that's what medical experts are saying, that was, is what makes sense when you look at the body, then, yeah, there's plausibility. You can assume that causality is, is more likely, that smoking caused periodontal disease. And lastly, um, this part over here is saying that if you can find some similar associations, so for example, vaping. Um, vaping is not exactly smoking cigarettes, but if you're using, uh, if you're, you know, using um, vaping methods, the question would be, does vaping cause periodontal disease? Well, you could probably say yes, because there is some association, so it's a different analogy that we're looking at. As opposed to cigarettes, we're looking at vaping now. So, or, or um, another one is shisha or hookah, right? Does that cause periodontal disease? Is there um, an association? And if so, then you can say, yeah, smoking, shisha, um, vaping, they all could lead or cause periodontal disease.